Hello everyone! Welcome to Better Scalability and More Isolation, the Cortex Shuffle Sharding story. Hope everyone's having a good KubeCon so far. So my name's Tom. I am uh, the VP Product at Grafana Labs. Um, in my what little spare time I have, I guess, uh, I'm one of the Prometheus uh, team. Um, my main contribution being the, the remote write code there. Uh, I also started the Cortex project, uh, which is the horizontally scalable version of Prometheus that's part of the CNCF sandbox. Um, more recently, I started Loki, which is uh, Grafana Labs um, log aggregation system. Uh, in uh, what you know, in when I'm not looking after these projects, I have a bunch of 3D printers sitting on my desk, and I used to make beer as well, but uh, I haven't actually had a chance to to brew for a while. So today we're going to talk about shuffle sharding um, and how it allows us to build a more scalable version of Cortex with, with better isolation. But before we do that, I'd like to spend some time just introducing you to Cortex, what it does, what it is, why it's important. Before we go on and talk about, you know, how we solved this problem before we added shuffle sharding. We'll then talk about shuffle sharding, what it does, and, and finally, how good it is. You know, and if it really delivers on, um, on what we said it would. So, without further ado, Cortex, horizontally scalable Prometheus. So, Prometheus is an awesome monitoring system. It's incredibly easy to use. And we see a lot of people get started with Prometheus very, very easily. You know, you, you deploy it alongside your applications. You, you maybe instrument your applications or, or add a few exporters to, to adapt them to Prometheus. And very quickly, you know, you attach your Grafana, very quickly you can build some really awesome dashboards, right? And you can really get some great insight into your application's behavior and, and start debugging it and start responding to any problems it might have. You know, it, it is a really powerful and flexible system. The challenge we see uh, in Prometheus is really when you start to grow beyond the confines of a single uh, location, beyond the confines of a single data center, a single region. You know, maybe you've got your application deployed in three different locations. You know, Grafana Labs, we run 15 plus Kubernetes clusters. In, in the first instance, what we see is, is users add data sources to Grafana for each one of these instances. Um, you know, this allows you to build dashboards with, with little drop downs that, that you can select what region you're interested in. I guess the reason Prometheus has to be deployed like this is because Prometheus has to be next to your application, right? It, it wants to talk to the local cluster to do service discovery, and it wants to connect directly to the application to collect metrics from it. Um, in the Prometheus world, there is a solution to, to kind of bringing this all together into a, a central global view. And I guess, you know, to be clear, the problem is, whilst it's fine, you know, this approach is fine for getting information about an individual cluster, there's no way in this approach of really getting a kind of global latency number or, or finding out what the global error rate is, you know. It just can't do it because each cluster is being monitored by an independent Prometheus. So in Prometheus world, we recommend people deploy uh, a global federation server. And this federation server can scrape the federation endpoint on each of your Prometheuses and bring that data into a single place where you can run these, these central queries, where you can ask things like, you know, what's my global latency? What's my slowest region and so on? You know, this, this, isn't, this isn't that tricky to set up. Um, it generally works reasonably well. You've got to, you know, you've got to get the authentication and firewall rules all kind of, all kind of working correctly, and you've got to secure the network and so on. But in general, this is this is feasible. This is possible. Where this starts to to break down is when people, you know, scale very large and start storing all the raw data in a single Prometheus server. It's very easy to overwhelm that central global federation server. So. We recommend, as best practices, that people only federate pre-aggregated data. You know, and, and commonly this might mean recording rules that have erased away, can, let's say, the instance label. Um, so these 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 are very useful for building those dashboards, but it, it really prevents you doing kind of drill down and ad hoc queries against this global federation server. You know, if this federation server points to a problem in a region, it won't be able to point to a problem with a particular instance of a service because you've erased that label away. Um, so we were looking, you know, five years ago now, we were looking for a, a different way of doing this, maybe a better way of doing this. And this is where we built Cortex, 
So Cortex replaces the need for that global federation server. And you can push, you can have all the edge locations push all their raw samples directly to that Cortex cluster. And this is this is good for two reasons. Right? One, um, you know, this is a push, not a pull now. So, so in some ways, this is uh, kind of more sympathetic towards how a lot of organizations have their networks organized. But also, the Cortex cluster is, is scalable. And so it can, as you add more clusters, as you add more metrics in individual locations, you can scale up that Cortex cluster to take all the load, all the raw data. And this means it makes it really easy to do these kind of ad hoc queries. It's got, you've got all the data there. You can drill down just within the central Cortex cluster. And because you've centralized all of this, there's also like one natural place to add things like long-term storage, to invest in query performance, and, and, and really make sure your users know there's one place to go to get all their, all their answers. So that's Cortex in a nutshell, really. It's a, a, a time series database. Um, you know, it, it uses the same storage engine and query engine as Prometheus. And what we've done in Cortex is really add the, the distributed systems glue to turn those from a kind of single node solution into something that works uh, in a horizontally scalable kind of clustered fashion. So Cortex is horizontally scalable. It's highly available. We replicate data in Cortex between nodes. This means when uh, when a node fails, you're not going to see gaps in your in your graphs. Um, and we add a, a more durable long-term storage. So in Cortex, you can store data in an object store um, and, and effectively store data for as long as you like. Um, and finally, one of the things I think that makes Cortex quite different to a lot of systems is it natively from day zero kind of built to be multi-tenant to support different isolated tenants um, on the same cluster. This means if you're uh, an internal kind of observability team providing a service to the rest of your organization, uh, Cortex is really easy to kind of deploy and add lots and lots of different isolated teams within your organization to, without having to spin up a separate cluster per team. Um, we've, you know, we, we joined the CNCF uh, a few years ago. We're uh, part of the incubating um, phase now, and it's Apache licensed. It's available on GitHub. A bit of a bit of a timeline, you know. As as I've mentioned, we kind of started the project. Uh, Julius and I started the project almost five years ago now. Um, we originally stored all the data in DynamoDB, in Amazon DynamoDB, um, and then over the next year or two, I added support for Bigtable and for Cassandra. Um, one thing I'm particularly proud of with Cortex is, uh, in the early days, I think we kind of got the the right path right. You know, we. Um, you know, it's very scalable and very performant from the get-go, and it didn't take us a long time to kind of, you know, make that kind of effectively done. Um, and so early on in the life of the project, we started focusing on query performance, on, on accelerating and distributing and parallelizing massive queries against Prometheus data. And I feel like we made uh, made some really good strides there with, with query caching, with, with parallelization and sharding, and I'm very proud of what we achieved. We joined the uh, the CNC, CNCF sandbox uh, just uh, about two and a half years ago now, and then really was the focus on uh, ease of use and, and on the community. We launched a website, we uh, did a 1.0 release, we wrote a load of docs. Generally, we really kind of put a lot of effort into making Cortex easier to use. Um, and now, now we're up to date. Now, more recently, in the past year or so, we've been focused on new and exciting features in Cortex. So... Uh, we added a system called block storage. This is uh, basically the same thing Thanos does, um, where we, we've we reduced the only dependency that Cortex has now is on an object store, um, making it a lot easier to deploy and manage. Uh, also, block storage is, is fantastically cheaper to operate than, uh, than the previous kind of DynamoDB chunk storage. Um, we added shuffle sharding towards the end of last year. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk, so I won't go into any more detail now. And then more recently, we've added things like Query Federation, uh, relaxing some of those uh, multi-tenancy isolation features so you can query data in multiple different tenants and uh, per tenant retention. So different tenants can have different amounts of data stored for different lengths of time. So yeah, really exciting, uh, really exciting progress on Cortex. Um, but today, we're going to talk about shuffle sharding. But to uh, tease you a little bit more, first I really have to describe... Um, how how we you know how things work before shuffle sharding. So in a Cortex system, you know one of the main goals of Cortex is to be this horizontally scalable. And what this means is we need to be able to take in data and and shard it and spread it 
amongst the nodes in a cluster. So we do this um, by hashing the labels within, uh, within the, the samples that get written. Um, and this is really how we make Cortex scalable, right? How we make a, a, a cluster in aggregate able to cope with more writes and more reads than any single node in that cluster can. This is all automatic. The user doesn't really have to configure anything, you know, and as you add new nodes, we can scale up and scale down as you remove nodes. It's really quite cool. The challenge with this is um, a, a single node outage can potentially impact all of the all of the tenants on the cluster, you know, the tenants are the cat and the dolphin and the fox. So to prevent this kind of single node outage, and you know, it's worth noting, as you add more nodes, the chance of any one of them failing just randomly is, is higher, right? To, to avoid this uh, outage from a node failure, we replicate the data between nodes. So we use a replication factor of three and a quorum reads and writes. What this means is when you write data, you rewrite to three nodes, but we only wait for a positive response from two of them, from a quorum of them. So this means when there's a node outage, you know you can continue to write uninterrupted to the cluster because we'll still be getting that positive response from two of the nodes. What you'll see though is if a second node fails, even with replication factor three, we're going to have an outage, right? Because we're not getting that positive response on writes. The, 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 we don't know that they've succeeded. Uh, and therefore, the, the, you basically have an outage for all of your tenants. Now, what's, what's potentially uh, more worrying is as Cortex clusters get bigger and bigger, you know, five years ago, we were running kind of four or five node clusters and, and 10 and 20 node clusters. Now we're running multi-hundred node clusters. And that chance of two node failures just randomly or through user error um, is getting higher, right? So the chance of there being a total outage on the cluster is getting higher. And it's worse than that. The, uh, you know, because every tenant in effect is writing to every node in the cluster, if there's a bug in Cortex, if there's a misconfiguration and the tenant finds a way to exploit that, you know, a poison request or a bad query could take out an entire cluster for all tenants. So, so these really are the problems we're trying to solve in uh, with shuffle sharding. And shuffle sharding, to be clear, is not the only way of solving it. We could, we could, we could do something simple, right? We could do uh, something, you know, we call bulkheads, right? This is where we effectively turn, you know, you can you can think of this as instead of having one big nine node cluster, you just have three smaller three node clusters, um, and you would just map tenants to clusters. And this way, an outage in, uh, you know, a poison request by cat would not affect, affect dolphin or, or, or fox, a sentence I, I never thought I'd say. You know, we also see, you know, a two node outage would have to be in the same shard to impact any tenant. You know, challenge here is that this mapping is relatively rigid. You know, it's very hard in this world to, to have a tenant that needs all nine nodes worth of throughput. Um, it's also hard, you know, if I want to scale up, you know, I, do I scale all of the shards up? Do I scale one of the shards up? What do I do, right? And generally, you can see how this kind of cellular approach is, is it can be a bit of a management burden. So, this is where shuffle sharding comes in. And now I'm going to try and explain to you how shuffle sharding works. And, and then we'll go on and analyze kind of how we tune it and, and what its properties are. So, first thing's worth saying is we didn't invent shuffle sharding. Um, the first time I uh, became aware of it was based on this uh, Amazon article in its uh, in its builders library about how they improved the isolation in Route 53, their, their DNS service, using this technique that they called shuffle sharding. Um, we read this when when this was published. You know, it got passed around internally at Grafana Labs, and we we're like, yeah, this would be a really kind of interesting piece of work to do on Cortex. You know, and we could see its direct benefits. So what shuffle sharding does is it effectively picks a random subcluster of the cluster for each tenant. You know, we we uh, pick this subset in random, but we but it is a deterministically random. So we we use the tenant ID. We actually hash the tenant ID to select the the nodes in the cluster, and then with those nodes in the cluster that that tenant is using, we use the normal cortex replication scheme. Um, to, to distribute rights among those nodes. This means, that, you know, this, this gives you a nice property where you can have tenants of different sizes, you know, using the same cluster. And you can control, depending on, like, how many nodes you give each tenant, the, the isolation between tenants. 
you know, to give you an example, you know, if we if 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 we have a, a three node outage in this situation, we can see that it's only affected one tenant because both Dolphin and, and Fox only had one node effect impacted by that outage. You know, so this is kind of the basic idea, right? It, it gives you much better tolerance to failure with, with kind of a partially degraded state. You know, another example, and you know, I talked about a poison request earlier. If Cat were to do a poison request, you can see how Dolphin and, and, and Fox are not affected because they've, again, only got one node that's been, been poisoned. So this is the basic idea. You know, we randomly select subsets of the node for each tenant, uh, subsets of the cluster for each tenant. We then randomly distribute using the normal scheme um, samples from these tenants within that subcluster. And then we make sure, you know, we want to tune the, the number of nodes that we give to each tenant to optimize between, you know, optimize for, for isolation. So this is where we kind of have to start thinking about, well, how many nodes do we want to give each tenant and how do we optimize isolation and, and what are the trade-offs I'm gonna play cards so imagine we had a 52 node cluster represented by a deck of cards you know we're gonna shuffle that deck and we're gonna deal out four cards right how many different hands do you think how many different combinations of four cards are there well it turns out there's some maths that can work this out it's called the n choose k problem and and 52 52 choose four is about 270,000, right? So if I were to pick sets of four nodes from my 52 node cluster, there's 270,000 different combinations of four nodes. It's a huge number. But that's actually in and of itself not super useful. What I really want to know is of those 270,000 combinations, how many of them share one node? How many of them share two nodes in common? You know, and it turns out that's not difficult to work out either. Um, there's a link in the top to a, a Stack Overflow article about how to work it out. My math is not good enough to, to derive this. But suffice to say, you know, almost three quarters of these, of these selections don't share any nodes in common. You know, a quarter of them share one node in common. And only about two and a half percent share two nodes in common. Right, so this is an incredibly kind of strong result that shows that you know, for argument's sake, a 52 node cluster where all the shuffle shards were of size four, a two node outage would only impact two and a half, well, less than two and a half percent of the tenants. Worst case, two and a half percent of the tenants. But there's more to it than that, right? When we're picking how many nodes to give each tenant, we, we need to trade off, uh, you know, fewer nodes means we're gonna have better isolation. If I give each tenant one node, you know the the num the you know this the the isolation between each tenant is going to be as good as it possibly can be, right? Because you know the chance of two tenants basically hitting the same node is just going to be like one in fifty-two. If I uh, give tenants more nodes, though, I'm going to be able to spread that load more evenly. And in a cortex cluster, the you know the tenants aren't all the same size, right? We have some very large tenants, we have some very small tenants, we have everything in between. So we need an algorithm really for picking how many nodes, how many shuffle shards to give each tenant. You know, one thing I would say is that, you know, better load balancing isn't just a nice to have, right? Better load balancing can lead to higher utilization of resources, can lead to a lower cost of running the cluster. And if you run Cortex as, a, as an offering, you know, as your SaaS platform, like we do in Grafana Cloud, you know, this is super important to us. So. We proposed a, a simple algorithm, right? This is to give tenants the number of shuffle shards uh, proportional to the number of series. So let's say, you know, if you've got a million series and we decide that we're going to give you one shuffle shard per 100,000, we'd give you 10 shuffle shards. And really what we want to do is find out what that, that 100,000 number is. You know, what is the right value for that number? What is that constant? So again, as I said earlier, my math is not good enough to derive this from kind of first principles. Um, I, if anyone in the audience knows how to do this kind of um, mathematically, I'd be really interested in chatting to you. But I'm a software engineer, so we built a simulator. Um, you know, the simulator kind of simulated a, a, a cortex cluster of a certain size. I think we simulated kind of 60, 70 nodes. Um, simulated a, a, a set of tenants of roughly you know, a distribution of sizes that we observe in our production clusters and simulated kind of, you know, picking shuffle shard sizes, 
distributing the samples to each of the virtual each of the nodes and measuring kind of the um, uh, the variance in node load just just based on the number of, uh, of series that they they have and the uh, number of tenants that were impacted by by two nodes going away what proportion of tenants would be impacted by two nodes we actually measured any two nodes going away I think the uh, the simulator is open source, um, so so do ask me uh, ask me afterwards if uh, you want to link to the source code. So suffice to say, we got a couple of graphs from the simulator. This one shows the um, the load balancing, how how well load is distributed within the cluster versus the size of each shuffle shard. So shuffle shard along the uh, x-axis, load load distribution along the y, and what you can see here is as you increase the size of the shuffle shards the distribution of load gets worse as we predicted um you can see kind of interestingly kind of the distribution of load starts to tail off i believe this happens as kind of just small tenants start to hit the minimum number of shuffle shards which is three for replication we we also see here that you know at kind of let's just pick a number then the numbers aren't super relevant in this this is just a general rule of thumb but at, let's say a shuffle shard size of 40,000 um, uh, series we can see that the maximum size a node gets to right the maximum number of series on a single node is about one and a half million and the minimum is about 75 uh, 750,000 right so there's a factor of two difference here right that gives us some kind of, you know, idea, you know, we probably don't want a factor of two difference in the in the size of our nodes, right? This is going to make it very hard to optimize um, utilization. We also see as you increase the size of the shard, the isolation measured as the percentage of tenants affected by a two node outage, the isolation starts to fall and, and eventually again plateaus. So we can see that, at, let's say, 30,000 again, 30, 40,000, you know, you've got way less than 1% of tenants in your cluster are affected by, by a two-node outage. You know, this was modeled with uh, 1,000 tenants. Um, we're averaging, I think, 100,000 series per tenants. One of the key things this um, simulation took into account was it, it also measured, you know, also simulated replication factor. So whilst working on this, we kind of picked some numbers, we debated internally, we kind of find where the two graphs cross, and we came up with this kind of good rule of thumb. You know, at around 20,000 series per shard, we have a roughly 20% variance in the uh, series per node, and roughly 2% of tenants affected by a two-node outage. And I believe our production config that we run on our large uh, Cortex clusters um, matches this roughly. I think 20, 30,000 series per shard is what we run internally. And this is really good because what this means is by by reducing the chance of an outage for most tenants uh, when there's two nodes two nodes that are, that are suffering problems, we've been able to scale up to even larger cortex clusters, you know, to hundreds of nodes as opposed to tens, right? We've also managed to better isolate tenants from each other. So there'll be less noisy neighbor, there'll be less chance of a poison pill infecting other tenants. We managed to do all of this whilst keeping the variance in load amongst these nodes relatively bound and and therefore kind of not reducing you know not increasing rather the the cost of running this cluster and not passing on any kind of cost to the customer for this so i think this is a really positive result um i'm i'm really kind of pleased with the work and and surprised at how effective shuffle sharding is we talked today about you know what cortex is the horizontally scalable version of prometheus that that kind of allows you to centralize your observability into a single single cluster and, and, and act as kind of your own service provider within within your organization. We've talked about how we distributed load before we implemented shuffle sharding and how we just distributed all tenants to all nodes and how we used a hashing algorithm and a kind of a DHT to, to do that. Then we've talked about shuffle sharding, how shuffle sharding um, effectively builds small virtual clusters inside a much larger real cluster and how these virtual clusters uh, improve the isolation between tenants at not a huge expense in, uh, in terms of utilization. And that's really the talk. Um, I wanted to say thank you to a few people. I wanted to say thank you to Marco. Um, Marco and, and thank you to Peter, who really did all the work here. Uh, they should be the ones giving this talk. What's more, kind of the, the slides I'm giving here are... Uh, 
are an evolution of Marco's internal slides that he gave uh, at a talk inside Grafana Labs. I also wanted to say thank you to Amazon. Um, they sponsored uh, Grafana Labs to make these changes to Cortex, um, really worked closely with us on the design and on reviewing it and, and really kind of giving us some great feedback. We, uh, if you want to hear more about how Grafana Labs and Amazon have worked together to, to help uh, Amazon launch their Prometheus service, there's a, there's a blog post on Amazon's blog and a blog on uh, Grafana's blog that really goes into a little detail about how, how the relationships worked and what kind of things we've built uh, for Amazon. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and open up the floor to, uh, to questions. Thank you.